Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm going to share my screen. I trust that everyone can see the screen on the sides. I'd like to start by saying, I'd like to congratulate everyone who has made time to avail themselves to attend this presentation because <clears throat> one of the key things that a lot of candidates are not aware of is registration is a conscious process. What you should be doing is from day one, from the first month of entering industry, you should be well versed with the outcomes. If you do not know them, ladies and gentlemen, I assure you that you will not be able to gather the relevant experience. With that said, let me start with the presentation. What is very crucial to mention before we start, ladies and gentlemen, is that this presentation is going to be addressing both the candidacy category and the professional category. And as you all know, I am here representing EXA, which is the Engineering Council of South Africa. Now, what this slide aims to impart is where EXA fails in the built environment. And as you can see, EXA is one of the councils that belong to the built environment, the Council of the Built Environment. And what is crucial for me to say while we are on the slide, ladies and gentlemen, is that a lot of people in industry Yes, have an a engineering qualification, but when they practice, or rather the area that they work with, is project management or construction management. What is crucial for us to understand is that if you are a practicing project manager, you register with that appropriate council. So do not set yourself up for failure because um, EXA is about solving engineering problems, and if you are concerned with managing uh, uh, projects, obviously you can clearly see that you will not be aligned. Let me not dwell on that too much because today's presentation is core to the 11 outcomes that are required for registration. Now, what is crucial to understand for all of our candidates and everyone who has a, an engineering qualification is that South Africa has chose to regulate the profession, right? And what this means is there is an act in place and registration is a tool that EXA uses to regulate the profession. Why are they doing this? This is all done because they are, their key goal is to ensure the safety of the people and the environment. So it is for the public interest. And what EXA does is they use this registration process to ensure quality. Everyone who is practicing and offering services in the engineering profession needs to be appropriately educated and trained according to the a widely accepted standard. Now, this one is a very, 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 very juicy one that a lot of uh, candidates are no, not aware of. But what we should all be understanding is that EXA, as part of the Act, has been given permission to establish a mechanism where its registered people can get recognition in other countries. What this is called is, is the International Engineering Alliance. EXA is a member of that. As part of the international agreements, they are bound by two types of agreements. There is the Accords, and the accords are regulating educational matters, and there is the agreements, and the agreements are regulating competencies. Ladies and gentlemen, let us stand here and understand that post your qualification, each and every one of us needs to go out into industry and acquire what is commonly known as an area of competence. Therefore, when you are registering, it is crucial that you pay attention to the agreements. Now, the interesting and the beautiful thing about the International Engineering Alliance is that it advances educational quality. In other words, a degree that is done in South Africa is in line and benchmarked with the best in the world, and it affords us mobility. Global mobility is so crucial. A good example to give is we do all know that some years, I think it was about a decade ago, 
a lot of our engineers actually moved to Australia. And the reason you, you saw that they could easily do that, it was because EXA is a member of the International Alliance. So ladies and gentlemen, please be aware of this. If you are registered at EXA as a professional, when you go to a member country, the professional title still stands. Now, I don't want to dwell too much on this because today time is not on our side, but what I want to just say is that the EIA is a nonprofit organization and it comprises of 36 regions that are within 28 countries. And these agreements in total, there is seven of them. So EXA is a member of the six that you see here in the slides. And what is crucial for us to note and for us to observe is that for each category, so when I speak about the word category, I'd like all of us to understand that I am referring to whether you're an engineer, a technologist or a technician. So if you want to go, for example, work in Canada and um, you are getting questions about your degree, you should refer to the Washington Accord. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, there is three accords that are in place and there is three in agreements and these agreements are divided according to the different categories. Now, this particular slide is one of my favorites because some of the people in industry don't actually understand the relationship between EXA and the VAs. Today's event is actually um, uh, uh, arranged by a VA in partnership with EXA. So what we should all understand is, I know a lot of people when they hear the word EXA, they just think of registration. But what we need to know, ladies and gentlemen, is that EXA also accredits universities. If you go study at VET, you go study at UCT, what you should be understanding is that that institution has been accredited in advance by EXA. Then I would naturally remember what we said, once you have your qualification, you are very well positioned to get your professional registration. And another crucial thing that they do is they regulate the professional conduct of all of us because it is very painful to see a bridge, a building falling on top of uh, ordinary innocent people. So the professional, the profession is regulated with exactly that to protect the public and the public is comprised of two components uh, critically, which is the people and the environment. <clears throat> then what we should be knowing, EXA is a statutory body. So what happens at EXA is that EXA registers all categories and all disciplines. Then what EXA does is they recognize the VAs. We are in industry, we commonly call them the VAs. So the engineering voluntary associations is bodies that are empowering and training, uh, offering appropriate training for the different disciplines. So as an example, I am electrical. So I belong to SIEE, uh, -E -E, which is the Electrical Engineer uh, Association. Today's event is organized by SIC, and that is a VA for the civil engineers. Now, what we should all be understanding is that EXA does not actually employ engineers. What they do is they rely on the VAs. So what the VAs do is they provide the peers, the reviewers, the assessors, the accreditors, the investigators, literally all of the role players that are actually involved with all of these functions. They are, these people are not residing with EXA. They are actually people who are residing with the VAs. Then crucial to understand, EXA also advises government. Now this picture here just shows the different as, uh, role players in the system. So when I say system, I'm talking with particular to registration. So what happens at EXA is EXA's got staff and this staff is predominantly um, um, administrative, right? Because they just register us as professionals. All the volunteers that are reviewing your reports, ladies and gentlemen, you will see as we go into the presentation what the system looks like. But all of those role players that are reviewing your reports, that are interviewing you, that are sitting in the committees, that are doing research for EXA, that are compiling the policies and standards, 
These are professionals that are drawn from the VAs. I'd like you to pay attention to this block here. These are role players that are external to EXA and they are basically very crucial to the registration process. You today is the applicant naturally and one of the very key role players that all of us should be knowing from day one when we start working is the referee because the referee is the first point of approval. Before even EXA looks at your report, the referee is the individual who is going to be your witness that indeed you are competent and you are ready to be registered. And naturally you will see that the supervisor and a mentor are very key in terms of designing the training that is going to ensure that you get your competence in line with the 11 outcomes. Now, this diagram here is, is, is one that all of us should be very familiar with because I take it that um, most of uh, the, the people who are attending today are actually individuals that hold a qualification in the engineering profession. So what we are saying here is that accredited, remember earlier we spoke about the course. So what we should all be understanding is that before you even go to access door, you need to be an individual who holds an accredited qualification. This word accredited means either EXA has pre-accredited the university, i.e. this would be the universities in South Africa, and predominantly these are government institutions. And then there is the International uh, Engineering Alliance that we spoke about earlier. And then the third category is actually an individual who has studied outside of South Africa and studied not in a country that is a member of the alliance, those people undergo what is called an independent education evaluation. What happens in that process is that your qualification or your combination of qualification is going to be evaluated to get substantial equivalence. This is very critical for us to, to, to know about uh, the process. Then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, once you have qualified a lot of people send me questions and they say, I have done my degree. I, I have not unfortunately finished one subject as part of my degree. Unfortunately, accredited program means a qualification that is 100% complete. So stage one of the registration process is you meeting that, having an engineering education. Then this particular point here is one that sometimes causes a lot of uh, confusion when um, employers are um, actually advertising their posts. Sometimes they even say you need to be a candidate. What we all need to understand by this candidate category is that it tells the employer that you have a degree and this degree is recognized as a degree in South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to just say at this point that if you do study in a country that is outside of South Africa and that is not a member of the alliances, there is obviously a possibility that what is called a degree in that country might be found to be like a BTEC in South Africa. So crucial to understand candidacy is a title that tells your employer that the qualification that you hold is accredited. Then what happens is the second stage of the registration, where basically everything is defined by the standards of professional competencies. And what happens here, ladies and gentlemen, is that EXA stipulates a period of three years. And this three years, ladies and gentlemen, is a minimum. So they are saying after three years of being in industry, I also need to say that you need to be in industry. So if you find yourself in the academic environment, in other words, you are a lecturer at a university, you are going to have challenges. So just note that for now, I don't really have much time to talk too much about that. But what I want to say is that this training and experience, it's an industry because what it does is it gives you an area of competence. By the time you get registered, you need to have a clearly defined area of competence. Then we are saying, once you've undergone the registration process, you become a professional. So you are registered either as a peer range or as a peer technician or peer technologist. Then what is very crucial to understand 
and I think this changed around 2008, is that when you get this title of PR range, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to use uh, PR range as a benchmark for the, in the interest of time. So if you get this title of PR range, it is not a lifelong title. There was a time, I think this was post 2006, if not 2008, there was a time when you got registered, it was a once-off process, but this is no longer the case. So when you are registered as a professional, you need to renew your registration every five years. And what is crucial to understand, of this five years, you are required to gather five CPD points annually. Now, a lot of people tend to lose their registration because they do not manage to have CPD. Ladies and gentlemen, I am kindly asking you to not give up on that because there are very easy ways of, of meeting and maintaining your CPD points. So here it is. So once you are a registered professional, you need to pay your annual fees, you need to maintain your CPD, and utmost important, you need to observe the code of conduct. You are somebody who is going to be professional, you carry yourself with integrity, honesty, and nothing less than that. So ladies and gentlemen, what is very crucial for us to understand is this today's topic is around training and experience. And my goal today is to impart the requirements. I want you to leave this room knowing clearly what it is that you need to be registered. Now, today's topic, I want us to focus on these uh, uh, benchmark uh, categories. So as you can see, there is, let's, let's just say the benchmarks is typically engineer, technologist, and technician, right? You, we all know about this category where if you hold the GCC, you can be registered as a certified engineer. But today's uh, presentation is predominantly focused on these qualifications that we get from the institutions, right? Um, and then what happens is just understand that this is the candidate category. So all you need to do in this category is to have a qualification, an engineering qualification. Because in South Africa, we do have this problem where Sometimes people that obviously are well-trained do engineering work, but according to the law, what should be happening is that each and every one of us need to hold a qualification because the fundamentals and the principles that are required to ensure that all work and all solutions that you offer are safe for the people can only be guaranteed by you getting the training at university or at the University of Technology. Then when you have qualified, you can register in any of these categories here. I don't wanna to dwell too much on this slide. And then it is very crucial to understand EXA does also have uh, specified categories. And as you can see, these are people who do very clearly defined work. So the qualifications there and the training is very specific. Now, for the purpose of the rest of the presentation, what I want us to pay attention to is the fact that for the new registration model, the 11 outcomes are the same for all categories. Let me say that again, because a lot of people, when, when sometimes I give classes to, to bring some clarity to some of the aspects, people start saying things like, oh, but I'm technician and you're talking about peer range. Ladies and gentlemen, what we need to understand is that the 11 outcomes are the same for all the categories. When I talk about our categories, please pay attention to the qualifications that are required for each and every category. So if you are having, let's just take an, as an example, let's take a diploma. If you are having an, a diploma, ladies and gentlemen, when you get registered, you will be a professional technician not a professional engineer, because there's a lot of um, conflict where people say, I've been working 10, 15 years and I've been doing engineering uh, uh, problems or type of complex uh, problems and they wanna be registered as PR range. We need to just observe that there is a minimum requirement in terms of the qualification. And then what is crucial to understand is that engineers are people that solve complex engineering problems, technologists solve broadly defined engineering problems, and then technicians solve well-defined problems. So ladies and gentlemen, when you go and read those standards, you will see that the, a slide is going to come shortly. 
you will see that there is a, a standards that clearly tell you what is required for you to get registered. And what you will observe in those standards is that for the different categories, this level descriptor is going to be different. So the, the, the peer range standard is going to talk about complex problems and it's going to give you characteristics that you can use for yourself to check whether the work you are doing is indeed complex or not. Now, this slide here is very crucial to share because what I'm observing is happening in industry is that a lot of the young uh, professionals are solely relying on the mentors to ensure that the work and that they do is in line with the requirements. And furthermore, if you are in a particular discipline, I want to draw your attention to this. There is guidelines, there is discipline specific guidelines that each of you should be reading. If you are civil, you need to go read the civil one. If you are electrical, you need to go read the electrical one. But what is crucial to pay attention to in this slide is that there is a policy that defines the registration system. And then there is documentation that talks about educational matters. And there is um, a documentation that talks about competencies. To be registered, you need to submit evidence against their competencies there. And these are commonly known as the 11 outcomes. Now, as I said earlier, if you want to be registered as candidate, ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing uh, um, demanding there because all you need is your education, right? For the particular category. So crucial to understand, I know there's a lot of conflict with people that have uh, the diplomas and subsequently do their BTEC. We will talk about that later. But what is, what is crucial for you to understand is that as, as a candidate, all you need is the educational part. If you want to be registered as a professional, ladies and gentlemen, the first step is education. Then the second step in, is demonstrating competence against the standards. All of us should be taking comfort in knowing that it is just not a random process. Everything is captured in the standards. And like I said earlier, it is further defined in terms of the discipline. So go and draw that discipline specific guideline and empower yourself. Now, I get a lot of uh, um, sort of issues around this. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that the registration process is def defines two methods of assessment. And these are basically the experience appraisal. If you have a paper there, just make a note for yourself that says the experience appraisal is a paper exercise. What is happening at the EA, which is the experience appraisal, is that the document that you have submitted is going to be assessed to find evidence for the 11 outcomes. So in other words, this is a documentary exercise. What happens during registration is that what is written on paper gets confirmed at the professional review. Now at the professional review, this is a verbal interview. It is verbal. So what happens is that what you have submitted on paper gets verified. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to just say this to you. What you need to understand is by the time you want to be registered as a professional, you need to be able to write and you need to be able to speak. So what normally happens is sometimes people are called for an interview and they sometimes do not understand that there are some uh, 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 special cases. So sometimes what happens at the experience appraisal stage is you are submitting evidence, but when the people are assessing your report, they are finding missing outcomes. Normally what they will do as part of that uh, uh, stage, which is stage one, or uh, um, yeah, stage one of the process, is they will call you for an interview. This is an EA interview. And what all of us need to understand about an EA interview is that you only go and give evidence for the missing outcomes. When you go for the professional review, ladies and gentlemen, you need to give evidence for all the 11 outcomes. Then crucial to understand is that all the candidates that get refused, 
Refused means that your application has gone through the full process and it has been found to not be adequate. A good example we gave earlier is somebody who works with construction management or project management who wants to register as a professional engineer. Now, what we must understand is when you are, you are refused, when your application is refused, you are afforded an advisory interview. And this interview needs to be recorded because crucial to understand about being refused is that you can appeal. There is an appeal process. If you as an individual feel that you have done everything in, as outlined in the standard, you can actually appeal the application. Now, here I don't even want to say too much because um, I'm not sure how my time is looking, but I want to really do justice to the outcomes. What I want you, you ladies and gentlemen to understand about this slide is that registration requires you to have a minimum of three years. And I want to just make an example just for us to be clear. If in the three years that you have been working as an example, I as a female take maternity leave of four months, it is very crucial for you to record that four months. Even if you are not doing engineering work, it needs to be recorded in the summary uh, experience summary report because the person who is assessing your report needs to add everything that is related to engineering work in industry. So what you shouldn't be doing, ladies and gentlemen, is be uh, skipping a gap because what people do is they go and write everything that is just engineering. No, you don't do that. When you write the report, you capture everything everything that you have been doing from the day that you graduated. What is very crucial to understand about training is that you need to check yourself. There is no good in you training without assessing yourself against the required competencies and more critically, their level. You will see when we get to a particular slide, Two, there are two aspects. There is 11 outcomes. And then for each of those 11 outcomes, there is a level of responsibility that you need to be discharging as an individual by the time you get registered. Now, a lot of people do not understand this. Registration is a conscious process. You need to actively, pro, not even actively, you need to be proactively ensuring that the training that you are doing is targeting some particular outcome. A lot of people, when they write the report, they really get stuck with the, the word limit. You will normally see when you read the standard, it will tell you for the engineering report, the limit is so much. The reason for that, ladies and gentlemen, is because it is not physically possible to write everything that you have done. So what needs to happen in the uh, uh, training? program is it's going to allow you to develop your competence to a point of being able to demonstrate the outcome at the required level. A lot of people are only getting to know these outcomes when they've worked for five years and subsequently they get disappointed because they realize that the work that they've been doing is only addressing two of the outcomes. So those of you who are here today well done to you for affording yourself an opportunity to become well-versed with the outcomes. I want to say this, ladies and gentlemen, registration, the onus of ensuring that the training that you receive is adequate as defined in the standard is the candidate's role. Yes, the mentor and the supervisors are there to assist you with this. But what you need to understand is that most of our mentors have been registered in the legacy system. So they are not sometimes well-versed with the new registration system. What I, advise, what I advise you to do is please go and, uh, and um, download that standard that guides the mentor and send it to them because most of them do not know the 11 outcomes because the legacy system was not modeled around the 11 outcomes. Now, the supervisor, it is crucial for all of us to understand that the supervisor is a person who is direct, who directs and controls the candidate's work. And as per the registration requirements, you need to be trained, you need to be afforded a period of two years within that, remember we spoke of the three years minimum. In that period of three years, two of the, the years is for you to learn 
So what happens normally is all of us, when we enter industry and we get to a particular uh, company, we need to ensure that we are appointed supervisors because supervisors are the people that will direct and control what you do. And what is crucial to understand is they take responsibility for the work because remember you are learning. So what we all must understand is that training is a task by task activity that is targeting the competencies. Ladies and gentlemen, I say this to people, when you are working, as an example, I just want to make a loose example. If you are working and you are finding yourself being uh, uh, made to take minutes at meetings and you are not doing technical work, you should be very concerned because in that two years, every task that you do should be targeted at developing some competency that is aligned to the standards. So what I want you to understand is that training is structured activities that are made up of courses and things like site exposure, things like you running projects, because this is what builds your experience. This is very crucial. Now, professionals in the engineering, uh, uh, okay, professional engineering practitioners, and I like to call these just professional engineers. There are people who are able to perform their functions because they have knowledge, they have skills, and one of the things that people overlook more often than not is attitude. Attitude is everything. Ladies and gentlemen, if you thought um, you can carry go around carrying yourself unprofessionally and it will catch up with you because when that referee writes the report, that is where they are going to reflect about you. They're going to say this candidate is outstanding, this candidate goes beyond the call of duty. But obviously, if you are lazy and, and, and you are not interested, it's going to catch up with you. So attitude, attitude is one of the things that we should all be paying attention to. It is a soft aspect, but it is one that is a make or break. Competence is developed by education, as we already said, training and experience. Ladies and gentlemen, let us understand the reason why training is done in industries because you need to have a particular area of competence. And what you are doing in the education is you are getting fundamentals that speak to everything. Now let's talk about the professional competencies that are required. And this is now boiling down to what is actually required for you to earn that professional title. These competencies are divided into 11 outcomes. Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention to this. When you are writing your report, whether it's a TR or an engineering report, what you need to understand is that the outcomes, there is 11 of them, and they are grouped into five sets. And as we go through them, you will see that these five sets are grouped in terms of similar activities. <laughs> then I've already spoken about this. What we need to understand is that the outcomes are the same for all categories. So sometimes I say to people, even if you, you, you prepare your, your, your work or write your report at the level of, a, of an engineer, which is complex problems, there's no problem with that because you would have exceeded the expectation for your category. In reality, we all need to understand that there are people who are in industry, some of them are technicians, but in real life, they are doing engineering work. Some of the people who are engineers in real life are doing technicians work it's very crucial for you to check yourself. And what we need to understand is those, remember I spoke about the standards. I said there's a standard for each category and what you will see being the core difference for the different uh, categories is the level descriptor. Pay attention to that. Now, here we start with the outcomes. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I can tell you now without a shadow of doubt that all of the people that you talk to that are either put in abeyance or that have been refused, the core reason is because of group one. Group one is the core reason for engineering. Group one is engineering problem solving. And what you need to do as part of outcome one is to define, investigate and analyze complex engineering problems. Now, for the purpose of today, I just want to focus on engineering because on engineers, and, and remember I said engineers are people who solve complex uh, engineering problems. So on this slide, I just wanna show you the differences between the different categories. 
So for technicians, when you submit that evidence, evidence speaks to the experience that you have done in industry, the problems that you need to be solving as a technician is broadly defined problems. If you are a technician, the problems that you saw will be well defined. And that is, we can all understand why. And this is the key reason for the different qualifications per category. Now let's just go and then zoom in on the actual outcomes. Outcome two says, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to just say, before we move away from outcome one, I want all of you to pay attention to the fact that investigate. As part of problem identification, you need to investigate. What a lot of people are doing when they're writing their reports is they are giving the project statement as a defining the engineering problem. No, this is not adequate by any standard, what we all need to understand is that when you are an engineer and you are given a problem, you never accept a problem for what it is given by the customer, because this is why they are, they are bringing you as an engineer into the picture. You have to go and investigate to clearly identify what is the engineering problem, because in life there's problems, but for registration, we need to be concerned with engineering problems. Then outcome two says what? By the time you are registering, you are somebody who is able to define a problem. And also by the time you get registered, which is a minimum of three years, you should be somebody who is capable of designing or developing a solution to a complex engineering problem. Pay attention to the fact that all the other categories, it is going to be broadly defined, well-defined. Uh, just keep that in mind, because for the interest of time, I want to just talk about the 11 outcomes. I don't want to zoom into uh, the level of complexity of each. Then crucial to understand, outcome three literally speaks about your qualification. What are those subjects that you did in university that you are applying to come up with these solutions? So when you are designing a solution or you are developing a solution for some engineering problem, you need to understand that it needs to, uh, to require some knowledge from university. If you are solving a problem and it doesn't require you to open a textbook, ladies and gentlemen, it is not a complex problem. It is not an engineering problem. An engineering problem should require you to apply some theory. And predominantly what happens with outcome three is we will just generally uh, um, understand this to be textbooks and then the second phase of it, which normally helps a lot of candidates, is software. Any software that we are using in industry to come up with solutions is based on some you know, fundamentals. So please, ladies and gentlemen, when you write your report, a lot of people are just going and saying, uh, I designed this, and they actually forget to mention the theory that they have applied. And secondly, to mention the software that they, the software that they have used to do their simulations. So ladies and gentlemen, let's observe this as group A. And please understand that if you want to be registered as a professional engineer, you cannot escape group A. And this is why we said earlier, somebody who is practicing as a project manager naturally will not be able to meet the requirements of uh, EXA because EXA is concerned with solving engineering problems. Let's move on to group B. Group B is managing engineering. So outcome number four requires of you to manage a part or all of one or more complex engineering activities. Ladies and gentlemen, I need to pause on this one because when a lot of people see outcome four, they misunderstand it to mean that you must go out into industry and practice as, an, as a project manager. This is not the case. They want you to be managing some engineering activity. So this could be something as, as, as uh, fundamental as a design. Remember, design's got multidisciplinary uh, uh, functions. If you are the lead designer, you will be managing all those different disciplines to come to some solution. So what they mean by activities, it's engineering activities, ladies and gentlemen. Also, if you've got a book there, just note that, of course, as part of managing, it is very crucial for you to understand what are the objectives and the goals of PM as a profession. Please have that understanding because a key 
uh, criteria that comes out of PM is contracts. So EXA wants you to understand matters of contracts, matter of managing time and money and all those likes. So what I am saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that when it comes to something like understanding project management, reading a textbook or uh, attending a course is adequate. But when we talk about managing an engineering activity, you have to have evidence of you as an individual doing it. Remember, we also spoke about that stage two, which is the professional review. Outcome five requires you to communicate clearly with others. This is very obvious why it is a core requirement. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say this. Anybody who works will make mistakes. It should not be understood that people that make mistakes are no. Anybody who does work will make mistakes. Tsunami that hit Japan is a very good example. Those engineers never designed the power station to withstand a tsunami because a tsunami was not a foreseeable impact. So what needs to happen with outcome five is you need to be able to represent your work. You need to go speak about your work and tell people why. Remember, as part of outcome one and two, what needs to happen, ladies and gentlemen, is that in engineering, there's normally different options to resolve a problem. So now you need to go and tell the people why you chose a particular option. So in other words, if you've got five options and you come to a design review committee and you tell them that your preferred option is option three, obviously you cannot do this if your communication skills are not on point. So outcome five requires you to communicate clearly with others. And I don't want to lie to you. A lot of people are getting themselves shortchanged because of this. And not because they do not know how to communicate clearly, but simply because of nerves. I beg you to either go for confidence coaching or public speaking because you do not really want to find yourself not getting registered because when you come into that room and you see the review panel, the nerves start uh, shooting off. Ladies and gentlemen, group C is impact of engineering activities. Now, outcome six says recognize and address the reasonably foreseeable impacts. Now, we all know that when we are dealing with engineering projects and engineering methods, as much as we make people's lives easy, when things go wrong, we really impact people, the environment, equipment, even animals. So what EXA wants you to be conscious of, ladies and gentlemen, is impacts. And normally what will happen with this outcome six is you are going to get these impacts from something like an EIA, an environmental impact assessment report. What EXA wants you to do as a professional is you need to address those impacts. Every risk or every impact that is identified needs to have a mitigating measure. And this needs to be done as part of outcome two. So if you are just going about solving the problem and not being concerned with the impacts that that project is going to have. Ladies and gentlemen, a good example is just something as fundamental as a plane. You are able to leave South Africa and land in New York after 12 hours, I believe it is, or 16 hours. You know, so, but when something goes wrong in that plane, a lot of people will die. So what we are saying is these impacts, they need to be mitigated in group A. Remember group A is what? Problem identification and problem solution. So EXA does not expect you to go and do this uh, environmental uh, impact assessment report because that is a profession on its own. But what they want you to do as part of outcome two, which is problem solution, is you need to mitigate those impacts. Outcome seven is to is meet all legal and regulatory requirements. This one is, is, is something that disadvantages a lot of professionals when they submit that report, because what they are doing is they are making assumptions, they are uh, drawing some um, factor that they use, like whether it's a safety factor or a probability factor, what is very crucial for you to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to mention the standard that you are complying to. This matter of outcome seven is going to help you when things go wrong. Because if you have complied to regulation, you are going to at least know that in terms of safety, you have at least done the minimum. 
a good example to mention with, with this matter of uh, um, legal and statutory requirements is even in South Africa, if you are in Cape Town and you are doing a solution in Cape Town, you need to be very conscious of the high wind that is happening in Cape Town. If you are designing in Limpopo or in Zanini, you need to be conscious of the high temperatures. So ladies and gentlemen, when you are doing your solutions, which is outcome two, you need to be very, 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 very clear to mention all these standards that you are complying to. And it's a matter of just simply saying that this wind speed that I'm using in Cape Town is drawn from the standard one, two, three, four, because we are all understanding that standards are written for conditions that are prevailing in a particular country. Let us move on to group D. Group D is a silent one and a very critical one. And in my humble opinion, registration is literally around group A and D, and what group A and uh, group D wants from you is for you to act ethically. This one shouldn't even be a matter of, it should be something we are doing, even from university, you should always be ethical. Exercise judgment, taking responsibility. So what we will see about outcome eight, you need to conduct engineering activities ethically. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to tell you one thing now while we are still on outcome eight. Obviously, when you write that report, you are going to say I'm ethical, you are going to say I'm professional and whatever. But what you need to be conscious of is that the referee, the person who is going to be the referee for your report is actually the person who's going to be the, the core witness of whether you are conducting yourself in an ethical matter. The matters of brown envelopes, the matters of taking shortcuts, we do not do this in the profession because the act asks of us to protect the people and the environment. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't even like talking about ethics because this one is just obvious and it's fundamental. Outcome nine, exercise sound judgment in the course of complex engineering activities. So this one, I'm just going to leave it at this. When you are dealing with an engineering problem, ladies and gentlemen, I want to just say to you, there has to be different options that you are available to you to solve the problem. And now when you look at outcome two, please understand that us as engineering professional, more often than not, we are not are reinventing the wheels. These solutions are available in industry. They're available in uh, all these uh, um, journals and papers that are published. They're available in textbooks. So what is very crucial for you to show when you are going for that interview, when you are submitting that report, is that you are somebody who applies sound engineering judgment. And the key uh, um, tip that I give to candidates is that the, the only way you can exercise judgment is when you compare. You are choosing between A, B, or C. And we all know, ladies and gentlemen, when we look at different options, normally what happens is that one was going to favor cost, another one is going to favor constructability, another one is going to favor uh, maintainability. So what we are saying here is EXA in that report wants to see that you are somebody who applies sound engineering judgment. By the time you prefer a particular option amongst a number of alternatives, you need to be given reasons of why that is the selected one. A key tip that I can give you is that a lot of people overlook things like space constraints. Space constraints is a thing. You want to build a substation. Is there space for you to build an open or you need to go for an insulated? So ladies and gentlemen, when you are writing your, your report, you will see that a lot of your, your coworkers that are, are in abeyance or have been declined, they normally the, the core reason is that they will be found outcome 10, not being responsible for the work. Outcome 10 needs you to be responsible for making decision in complex engineering activities. Now, when you are writing your report, by the time you are writing that engineering report, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to say to you is this, 
The engineering report is evidence of your competence. The minute you use words like my supervisor, I was supervised along with, and you use words like we and them, it was. You are immediately going to disadvantage yourself because when you are writing the report, EXA wants to know about your responsibilities. EXA wants to know about your sound engineering judgment. Now, outcome 11. Okay, my mouse is giving me some challenges. Outcome 11 is uh, undertake initial, initial professional development. This is commonly known as IDP. I don't even want to dwell with this on this because we already spoke about this. We said uh, to build competencies, you need education, you need training, you need experience. So what is crucial to understand about outcome 11 is when you write that report, you need to clearly say, what steps did you take to build your competence? Ladies and gentlemen, let me pause here and say something. And this is very crucial because a lot of people do not have this understanding. The training experience report is evidence of how you build your competence in a particular area. So as an example, I work with power lines. So it's going to record the training that I have undergone to become somebody who is competent in designing power lines. So this training needs to be relevant training. It is just not random training. What is key for all of us to understand is that by the time you go get registered, you need to have an area of competence, ladies and gentlemen. Write that down. When you are writing that report, you need to have a clear answer on your area of competence. What is your area of competence? As an example, I am a high voltage power line design engineer. And you see how I'm very exact about high voltage. I do not do low voltage. I do not do reticulation. So ladies and gentlemen, all I am saying is by the time you register, let it be clear that I am civil in structures. I am civil in water. That needs to be very clear. It must not be general. Now, what is very crucial to understand here is when you are writing your report, ladies and gentlemen, and you will see uh, when we get to the um, outcomes, how you align this. The level of response, the degree of responsibility is very crucial. There are a lot of people that are getting deferred, that are getting put in a pains because they, yes, they do do the activity, but they never get to a point of being responsible, but not accountable. What is crucial for us to understand is by the time you are registering with EXA, outcome one, which is group A. So let me just rather say group A. Group A, you need to be an individual that is performing. And what performing means is that you are doing the work, you are taking full responsibility of the work, but you are not accountable because accountability is a title that comes with PR range. So if we put this loosely, it means you cannot sign off the work. So there will be somebody who is registered who must be accountable for the work. But what, what I want you to just pay attention to is this. When you get to industry, what normally happens, and, and, and by the way, as part of the slide, let me give you guys a tip. A lot of people write their reports and very quickly in that report, they want to be seen as somebody who is responsible, somebody who is killing it. This is not what EXA wants. EXA wants to see a clearly defined uh, route of how you build your competence. So when you start your report, you are obviously going to be somebody who observes. You are going to observe processes. You are going to observe how your company executes their work because each and every company has got their own cultures. So when you are starting, you are at responsibility level A, you are somebody who is being observing, you are exposed to things. As you grow, you start assisting because you are working under close supervision. At some point, you must be participating. What happens there is that people are trusting you to run with a particular activity under limited supervision. Because remember, what is crucial to say here about limited supervision is this. A lot of people must understand that the theory that is defined in a textbook is ideal. So the textbook gives you the ideal theory. But ladies and gentlemen, when we are putting together solutions, 
that are going to be in some area in South Africa, we need to understand that there's prevailing conditions. So these prevailing conditions always require you to understand other aspects that are not captured by theory. And normally what happens is that a supervisor is somebody who's going to tell you that, yes, an, a, a minimum uh, um, design of this is, but if you are designing it in the coast, as an example, there's corrosion because of the, 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 uh, um, the acidity that's in the air, remember, because it's coastal. So limited supervision speaks to the fact that you are gathering experience and what experience does is it makes you understand how to further enhance your designs as per the, the textbook. Because a textbook will tell label how to design a power line. But if I design a power line in Cape Town, if I design it in the coast, there are different aspects that I need to take care of. So this is what they mean by participating. So at this point, you will be performing that specific function, but you will still be having limited supervision because the people that have been doing this for 20 years are going to tell you that as much as this works in a textbook, in real life, it actually doesn't work. Contributing. By the time you are contributing, you can fully do the work. And normally what happens there is that the work that you are doing it can be approved without anybody really bothering to scrutinize it. So it is very crucial for us to understand that when we are writing our TRs, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to pause a little and because this is very crucial. When you are writing your TRs, first point that we should be noting is that every TR, basically the training engineering report, has to have an organogram. In that organogram, what EXA is trying to rate is your degree of responsibility. So what you are showing in that organogram is that at this point, I am an EIT. I'm getting trained. At some point, you are participating. So ideally, by the time you get registered with EXA, in that organogram, there will be other people below you that now you are training on those same activities that you were trained on. But ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand that, especially in the category PR range, the level of responsibility needs to uh, increase. And by the time you are getting registered, you need to be at level E, because what that means is that you are literally discharging your duties, same level as a registered person. The only thing that is missing at that point is registration. So you are responsible, but you are not accountable. I don't want to dwell on this because this is just a general way of uh, some, because it is very crucial for us to understand that these words, if we use them in our reports, they help us greatly. So when you start training, you are somebody who appreciates, you appreciate, and then there's knowledge, there's experience. And then by the time you register, some of the people in this group are going to be registering after working for 10 years. So obviously that candidate is going to be capable of doing a lot. Now, I just want to show you something quickly. I have a feeling that my time is, is doing very... So, ladies and gentlemen, when we look at the outcomes, please pay attention to this column here. What this column is showing us is the level of responsibility that is required for those outcomes. And crucial to understand is that group A and group D, as you can see, they're at responsibility level E because this is what uh, registration in engineering is concerned with. It is concerned with problem identification, problem solution using theory. And remember, we spoke about standards, complying, your designs are complying to some standard and you are exercising, you are exercising sound engineering judgment. I'm going to move. Now, this particular slide here I have put for you guys to understand that when you are doing your engineering report, you can talk about a complex engineering problem and at your own leisure, you will read the characteristics of how to identify a complex engineering problem. And then the second slide is just showing a complex engineering activity. What is crucial for you guys to understand is when you are writing your engineering report, you need to self-assess. As part of that report, self-assessment is crucial. So when you are putting any evidence, you need to tell EXA, is this a complex engineering problem or is this a complex engineering activity? And all these slides are doing is they are showing you the characteristics that you can use to identify. 
Now let's talk about registering as a candidate. There isn't really nothing to say here and I, I, I wish for you to allow me to skip this slide because literally what is happening here is, is your general information of, of crucial is your qualification, the VA that you are a member of, obviously where you are employed because remember what I said, you need to be in industry. And all you need to pay attention to here is that even if you do not register as a candidate in your first year of qualification, at the point that you do register, you will see those fees. And then obviously declaration and proof of identity. A lot of people do not understand that this is uh, um, uh, uh, boiling down to code of conduct. When you put this, you are declaring that everything in this report is my work. You are declaring that the report is written by myself. There are people in the industry who think they can go and have people write their reports for them. You will unfortunately get caught. Don't do it, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk about professional registration. Everybody in this room is concerned with getting registered as a professional. And what is very crucial to just understand is that if you are somebody who once got uh, refused, or if you are somebody who has a candidate, it is very crucial for you to put those previous and current registrations that you have. And as you can see, all I wanna say here is that there is a one-off application fee that all of us have to pay. And if you are not registered as a candidate, as you can see, the fees will be more. But what I want you, you guys to understand is that this is additional to the annual fees. So if you're already a candidate, you will be paying your annual fees. And then this is a one-off registration fee. Remember we spoke about the, the referee? What is happening with a lot of candidates, and this is so unfortunate, it is so unfortunate and it really hurts me because what happens with the referee report is you as the candidate, you will never see it. So the referees are people that need to send this report straight to EXA directly. And what you guys should note is that if you are registering as a PR range, you need to have two registered uh, uh, um, referees and in that, in terms of category, they can be peer range or they can be a peer technician. And then if you are registering as a technologist or a technician, you need to have three. You need to have three referees. And remember, you can also use a peer range. Now, all I want to say is that in this slide, what, what a lot of people don't understand is that there is nothing wrong with you registering straight as a professional. You don't necessarily have to start as candidate. You can go straight and, and register in a professional category. But what the disadvantage there is that you are going to not know what the outcomes are. Because when you register as a candidate, all of these documentation are sent to you so that you can read and make yourself comfortable of what type of experience you need to get when you are in industry. A lot of people like to know about the TR. A TR is a training and experience report. Ladies and gentlemen, what this report does, it, it captures how you build your competence. Please take this, my word for it, when I say that your training experience report is one that captures how you build your competence. Understand it as that. The summary training report is the one that I said, even if you go on maternity leave, you still need to capture that period in the summary uh, report. Then the crucial report that all of us need to be worried about when we are registering is the engineering report. Ladies and gentlemen, this report needs to cover all the 11 outcomes. Why? Because this report is actually evidence of your competence. The TR is how you build your competence. The engineering report is evidence of your competence. So when you write this, be very conscious to say, I did, I am responsible, I decided, I analyzed. A lot of people don't do this. They write about a project, random in the context of the project. No, registration is about your competence. So in that report, EXA wants to see evidence of all 11 outcomes. We spoke about the IDP, which is basically the training you underwent, whether it doesn't have to be CPD accredited, ladies and gentlemen, because a lot of people do get stuck with this. They say, oh, my training is not CPD accredited. No, when it's IDP, it does not have to be accredited. It's only when you are registered where CPD counts. Then what is crucial to understand when you are going for that PR review, you have to prepare a presentation. 
And this presentation is going to cover all 11 outcomes. And by the way, it's 15 minutes long. Now we don't have time to talk about this because I, I, I'm supposed to get a note of how I'm doing on time, but I'm not very good at multitasking. Uh, all I want you guys to understand on the slide is that in green is a, a applicant who meets the requirements from day one and goes through the process without any challenges. And then what you are seeing on the right is if you are assessed and there's two negative outcomes, more than two negative outcomes, ladies and gentlemen, what is going to happen is that you are going to be called for an interview where they are going to source more information, more direct information with regards to the missing outcomes. And if you are kept in abeyance, please understand that abeyance means that you go back into industry and get more relevant work. So as an example, normally in abeyance, you are asked to go do a more complex pro project or you are asked to go be do a project where you are the responsible person. Because sometimes when people write about these reports, the level of responsibility is a problem. I don't even wanna talk all we need to understand here is that when you are refused, you will see here in orange, if your application is refused, all of us just need to understand that you can apply at any given time when you have gathered the relevant, uh, remember we spoke about an advisory interview. They are going to tell you at the interview what is outstanding and then you can reapply at the time that you are ready. There is no particular time constraint on when you can apply, because a lot of people ask me that. Uh, I, I was uh, um, refused. Do I need to wait a year? No. All you need to understand is as long as you meet the requirements that are outstanding, as shown at the advisory interview, you are ready to go. This slide just shows that back in the day when I registered in 2008, XI used to issue us with the hard copy certificate. And now because we all know about 4IR and technology, these days certificates are electronic. And all this slide is showing you is how to just understand that your, when your, your certificate comes, these are the components that you should be seeing in your certificate. And obviously more critically is the XI uh, uh, logo there. Then what we are saying here is that in terms of um, Certifying, there is no issue there. EXA does, does have people that can do that for you. A lot of people question why electronic, because we all want to frame that certificate. What I can say is that that is as, at per, as per the Electronic Communication and Transactional Act. So everything is okay there. And also what I need to say is that if you do want EXA to print that certificate for you, this is not a problem. They do do it, but it's at an additional charge. And just to close my interview, these are the, uh, my presentation. These are the people that you can contact if you have any point of clarification at EXA. You will be getting the presentation. And the presentation that you will be re receiving, ladies and gentlemen, will be more detailed in terms of other aspects. So if you do have a point of clarification, please feel free to email me, whether on Facebook or send me a comment or actually you can send that question to the organizer and then we will respond to them. With that said, let me say thank you for paying attention. I think I went over my allocated time. Yeah, but it was very crucial that we do justice to each of the requirements so that when we go home, we know exactly what it is that we need to do to prepare our reports. And with that, I want to say thank you to the chair. Thank you.